I'm here with David Casson or Kassan, depending on where you're from. Uh, and so, <laughs> so uh, uh, we're just going to continue this interview we've been doing for the last 45 minutes without a camera. Uh, yeah, just hanging out. Yeah, just hanging out and talking. So, so let me let me start. I think most people are going to know who you are, but you've been just just for a brief introduction. You're a, a figure painter, mostly a figure painter. Although you're talking about going out and doing some alla prima here. In yeah, for fun. I mean, I'm going to do some landscapes. I actually studied landscape in Italy about two years ago with Israel Hirschberg oh, okay. uh, for a month, um, just to just to figure stuff out. Like yeah. I'm I'm definitely not advanced or anything in that, so I'm learning a lot. Does it bring anything to your figure painting, to your portrait? Always. Yeah, yeah, everything does. Any, any painting, any looking, any seeing, uh, you, you, it augments what you're working on in your studio. Hmm. So this idea of atmosphere in a landscape, how can I get that atmosphere in a figure? Right. You know, just the, uh, the depth of field is a little different. Yeah. 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 Well, and that brings up a good point because a lot of the stuff that you're doing is like hyper detailed and real you do a lot of like small textural things and and so i would imagine that's an important decision that you're trying to make wh when you're establishing a hierarchy within a painting or something like that um do you fight that a lot because you have a tendency to go so deep well work it's it's interesting when you say detail i don't um it's funny i have friends that do big paintings where they paint every pore Mm -hmm. And I don't think of a painting as like, I never paint eyelashes or even the hairs mm -hmm. on an eyebrow or, or the pores. I create texture within a painting that mimics what that does. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not sitting there like with a one hair brush right. doing um, detail. I am trying to understand uh, how the subtle transitions are in form and color and temperature right. and all that stuff. So that's, that's the detail aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It's a more of a formalistic aspect of detail. It's, it's, I want to understand the holistic idea of how something turns on a scale where it makes it more human. Right. So everything I do is life size. And the idea of adding fidelity to something throughout the entire piece and making them life size, it's, it's exactly as we're having a conversation right now. To me, I, as the viewer, if you were the painting, mm -hmm. If, I, if it was the exact painting of you right now, I choose what I want to focus on. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like, oh, I want to look at your hands, now your face is blurry to me. Right. Because it's life size. So I'm not dictating how the viewer sees the painting. I'm bringing a painting to the viewer Did that they, they dictate how they want to interact with it okay. and how they want to have, to have the conversation. Yeah. Well, that's, just, that's just like your paint, like, just how you're with real people is, is, is my ultimate goal is to make something as living and lifelike as possible. Right. So, so the scale is what really dictates that. If if you were doing something that was a quarter of the size, you might approach it differently. Yeah, I don't. Do, I wouldn't do it. Oh, okay. No, everything I have I do is is almost exactly life size. Maybe demos might be a little smaller, but mm -hmm. I've been programmed to paint everything pretty much life size, hmm. just because I want to have um, that interaction again. Yeah. Is I want to make a tromploy figure. Right. So you know, people have tromploy things that fool your eye. But I want to do the same thing for um, for a figurative painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we talk in, in tattooing a lot about about establishing a hierarchy and, and determining like drawing to the space and, and uh, with the flow of the body yeah. and, and bringing the viewer's eye where you want it to start and then moving it from there. But your approach with a life size figure is let a person walk up to it and then let them dictate how they move through the painting. Yeah, basically, it's 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 crazy in today's world because uh, my paintings are made to be seen in real life. Mm -hmm. 99% of the people that ever see my work only see it on a screen, a right. flat screen, where they can't go up to the painting and chip off pieces with their fingernail. Right. And the tactile feel, it's different, I think, the te like, you guys deal with texture and skin all the time. With painting, uh, the surface is so important, it, I always say it has a heartbeat, and that it should have interest and texture, and every, every part should be considered mm -hmm. on the surface of a painting, almost like a song has distortion and it has clean areas that are quiet mm -hmm. and then it has other parts that are, are more silent you know it's, and that's yeah. how the surface should be yeah. within a piece yeah yeah I, I, that I tactile like feel and, and having texture in a painting the texture pulls into the viewer space as well not just the viewers interaction with the painting going into the painting it's the painting comes into your space hmm. are, are you thinking when I've only seen one of your pieces in um, in, in person, and it was last year's Portrait Society piece with the uh, the woman the, with the cigarette. No, was she? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Well, with the yeah, yeah. with the hand oh, up. That's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, are you thinking? Um, and I, I, I see that. I would now that you mention it. Uh, I, 
that that you do tend to just kind of um, to kind of move around freely through the painting. I, you kind of are making it. Did, I don't know that I walked up and saw one thing that I wanted that, that I thought you wanted me to see first. I felt like yeah. I just kind of meandered through the painting quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, I, I I keep it very much like I said about the viewer. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, are you thinking? Uh, you're talking about every piece of the canvas, um, uh, the importance of each piece of the canvas. Are you thinking of? Of some areas supporting other areas? Or oh, yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I, I think of composition in a very formalistic way, almost like a, a Japanese print mm -hmm. would be measuring spaces between, like empty space mm -hmm. around the figure is very important. I used to do a lot of uh, text elements in paintings for yeah. design yeah. And, and incorporating, like, because I was really into street art and graffiti as a kid. Right. And uh, as I grew up, I became a graphic designer in New York for a few years. Mm -hmm. and. I used to think of designing a website as being a, an abstract painting that just has information. And hier there's a hierarchy of information that you put into designs right. with text. And so that I would use that, incorporate that aspect into my paintings because it was just what I was interested in. Right. So there's like a lot of abstraction that happens within my background so that the figure can come forward a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I am considering edges and softness of edges. So not everything has a hard, sharp edge mm -hmm. to it. Because the way the eye sees with uh, it's the binocular vision that we have, mm -hmm. we understand that there's that depth around the figure. So those aren't going to be edges that are farther away from you are going to be are going to be less sharp. Yeah. You know, so they're going to sure. be soft as as you create atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So you want your idea. I want my paintings to be this idea where the viewer can come in and put their hand through the painting and touch the back of the head of the subject. Right. There's so much atmosphere and depth. And that's why landscape painting is, is key to that. It's learning more about atmosphere mm -hmm. and how um, the eye moves within space and spatial relationships. Right. And that's all drawing. Yeah. And I, I, I see that with tattoos all the time about how, um, like good tattoos, where the person, there's that illusion of how, of space within the tattoo. And right. it's, it's really amazing. It, it's something that's come along, in, in my mind, it's developed so much, well, I guess just with the technology age and so, so much more information being shared, but that's not something that, it's not a term, the term atmosphere or, or even edges in tattooing. It wasn't something that you really heard 15 years ago. I mean, edges were big, bold, black lines 15 years ago, almost okay. all the time. Now, like, a lot of people tried to get away from using black, and they did a lot of, like, color line work and stuff that kind of... Uh, Prove not to work very well. One thing that you have to have in tattooing is, is strong contrast. You yeah. just need black because yeah. it has to live in a body for a long period of time. But uh, so, th but that's that's one difference. Is you do need, you probably need to push contrast even harder than you're comfortable with uh, in, in tattooing as opposed to painting. But it is true that that as this crossover happens between painters and tattooers, we're at a paint, basically a tattoo gathering now, and we have you and Boris Vallejo and Julie yeah. Bell and yeah. uh, all these painters. Here, so they're starting to to meld a little bit, and a lot of the a lot of the um, terms that are used in painting are finding their way into tattooing. Yeah. I, we interviewed Nick Baxter a while ago, and we're doing another interview with him here this weekend. But he talks about glazing and tattooing. He talks about um, layering, you know, doing tattoos in, in multiple layers and building up textures over mm -hmm. over multiple sittings, almost like you were yeah, glazing yeah. an oil painting. And it's such a new thing I think, I think you're getting um like I, I have friends that are painters and tattoo artists like sergio sanchez and mm -hmm. and and sean uh, barber, barber. Mm -hmm. you know and, and i see that what they're doing with tattooing is um I, I, like i think they got a lot of shit when they started in a way as being like oh i've like that's too soft that won't stay in the body very long mm -hmm. but then when it heals it's actually okay yeah you know and mm -hmm. actually i think tattoos over time they kind of bleed slightly mm -hmm. right so i think that even that bleeding helps the edges yeah within within a tattoo I, you if know? you're allowing for those things you can actually yeah. use it to your advantage to create atmosphere yeah. i think yeah. you know with with sharper bolder images in the you know in the foreground and then letting some of those natural things that happen with skin over time work in your favor um if yeah. if you have the foresight to plan for it i guess yeah. um talk a little bit you've besides being a painter you've become pretty entrepreneurial lately you've done you've uh you put out the parallel palette which i yeah, yeah. bought one on the kickstarter awesome, and man. i love thanks, it cheers i love it yeah thanks absolutely. for the support yeah absolutely it's funny i saw i saw someone here with one uh yeah. in the painting room i was like it made its way to italy <laughs> it just awesome. blew my mind i'm mm -hmm. like i took a photo to send my business partner yeah like the guy who uh who does all the logistics and stuff yeah and Wh what was your what was your did you have a big role in the production of it in the yeah so that whole started with uh it's weird. I've been using it for about 10 years, and it just I wanted to save my back, and I wanted to have right. the, the paint and the painting in, in the same light mm -hmm. as, and 
everything is a heads-up display. And so right. I thought it would be a smart idea to try to get the painting or the palette up as close as I could to the painting right. so I wouldn't have to stress my back at all. And um, I, I made one that we handmade a while with a guy that I met at a conference who wanted to help out. And he was an automotive designer and a product man, project product designer mm -hmm. and he was hand making them in his garage which was which was cool yeah but we had to charge a lot because the materials were really expensive and it was just kind of uh, i think i made five hundred dollars and yeah. i think we sold two three hundred of them oh wow and so we kind of like stopped production on that because i was and then the guy got sick and he didn't tell me and i was like mm -hmm. nothing this is project is not worth you getting sick you know what i mean over and right he just didn't tell me because he thought he was letting me down yeah. but um great guy and then my buddy who i grew up with like we were in uh like just we were in boy scouts together like way back when and uh we, we decided to uh can you hear it can they hear with the music i think we can hear. i don't know I, I, they just they just grabbed our our camera girl and pulled her away so yeah. i'm not sure oh maybe they're saying that we can turn the music down in here i'm not sure oh well we can keep you on oh wow oh yeah sure enough wow thanks emily um, I don't know if I don't know how Camera much that music girl. was getting to uh, to the uh, viewer, anyways. But because um, oh, we have the mics, yeah, we have the mics. Yeah. Um, so, so Dave and I just were getting beers. Like I, we hung out in the city all the time together, and he's like, "Yeah, we should uh, we should make the palette again." I'm like, "What do you mean? Like we should like really produce it, get a manufacturer, and and learn about that aspect of like business, and, and try yeah. to do it." And I'm like. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I invested all my money, like about $9,000 into um, designing it, engineering it. We had to do like, we'd made a 3D CAD of, of uh, the yeah. actual product and, and sent it to a, an engineering company. And they looked at our CAD like, and kind of laughed at it because <laughs> right. uh, it was pretty rudimentary. Yeah. And then we learned like how molds are made and injection molds and how... Um, how much pressure you need to actually push the, the, the material into the mold to mm -hmm. be able to pull it, which is the reason why the size is it is. We couldn't go any bigger because oh, okay. uh, the, the injection molds would have been three times as expensive because they, had, they needed a heavier machine to push the, the mold in. Uh, I see. So, so what we're working on is actually making it so you can actually double them up. We, we get all the time about this idea that it's too small. Yeah. But I, I, I invented it so I could travel with it because yeah. I travel so much. And also for demos, when I when I teach, people can see exactly what I'm mixing, and I know other demo artist friends that that are using it as well, and they love that idea that yeah. you don't have to answer the question every minute of what color did you just use? Right? Like, did you just watch? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but That's uh, if, if we were talking about Jeff Hine earlier, and I did yeah. his workshop, and he was like, "I feel free to ask questions and to talk." He's like, "Just don't ask me what color I'm using." Yeah, That's the only yeah, thing I yeah. refuse to answer. Well, no, it's just it's it's a, it breaks up your mind, your your thought process as you're working. Yeah. So it, it gets a little frustrating, but. Yeah. It's funny, I had, my last workshop, I had a woman that literally questioned everything I just said. <laughs> she would ask her, what was that? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wow. And even like the other students were like, did she just ask again? <laughs> what is it is? Like, like every 10 minutes she'd be doing it. And yeah. It was cute though. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember, I, I, forget, I think it was Jeff that was just like, I, you know, he breaks his palette down and he's just like, whatever this pile of color is right here yeah, that's already yeah. been, that's been on here for 20 minutes, just added cad red to it. And that's what color I have right now. I don't know well, what think, that is. I think painting is all about emotional responses. So uh -huh. that your emotional responses are happening on your palette just as they are within the painting. Right. And so it's hard to, hard to dissect what it, what your thought was 10 mm -hmm. minutes ago. Cause, yeah. cause you're doing it in a, um, not in a mechanical way, but in an intuitive way. Right. So it's it's tough to yeah it's tough to 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 rewind all the steps to to explain it. Yeah. So I can see where it, yeah, yeah exactly like that puddle is what it was. <laughs> is what it was, and this you is know? what I did to it. Yeah. Just at this last mark. Yeah. Like I have puddles all the time. I'm just like that actually works. Right. And I want to warm it up, or I want to cool it down, right. or I want to lighten it or darken it value wise. So yeah. it's really it's really um yeah it, it you want to make that process as intuitive, and again having a palette as close as possible mm -hmm. and not ever having to look down, it, it helps in the process. It yeah. speeds it up. I, I love, I do love the size of, of that palette for that reason that I, I, I go um, on Wednesday nights, we have a group that gets together and, and, um, and paints a model and it's so nice cause it drops in my bag and uh, you know, the only thing I have to keep up with is a tripod, but other than that, it's not yeah. a big deal. Uh, and so I love it for that, but yeah, I'm sure you've heard a lot, like a studio version that, that was this big would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, we actually, so we made a bar that can connect two pallets together that connects to a tripod. We haven't right. released it yet. It's actually really expensive for us to make because we, we've been hand making it. Oh, so okay. we're, we're probably going to come out, maybe we'll, we'll manufacture that. But we also just did extra glass pieces 
that yeah, okay. are going to start selling probably in like the next month where uh, you just, if you you fill it up your mixing area, you take mm-hmm. the glass out oh, and okay. throw another piece of glass in, in like, okay. like that. Oh, that's Super nice. Super easy. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about you teach a lot, right? Yes. You, you travel around and teach. And, um, and you're doing something new now since you're not able to teach all over the world all the time. You're, uh, you're going to try to do some online kind of critiquing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to do a mentorship program for, for artists. I'm really excited about it because I'll, I'll have repeat customers or customers, repeat students mm-hmm. who, uh, who travel from different cities sometimes to study with me. And I think it gets really expensive. And it's hard for me to follow everybody, what they're doing, and, and pick up right away. So I'm doing a year-long um, mentorship with uh, my fiance is going to be also teaching. What's her name? Amazing. We talked about Shana, her. Shana Levinson. Shana Levinson. She's, she's a uh, painter as well. Yeah, she's an amazing painter. She's getting her master's right now at uh, at uh, Art Academy mm. in uh, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And so we're both uh, going to approach uh, critiquing in a way that is is slightly different. Like she has a like more of a feminine voice and a more a nurturing kind of voice. And I'm going to be very challenging at the same time. Uh-huh. So we're gonna we're gonna it's going to be a great um, a lot of fun to uh to see how people grow over the time period yeah. it's funny we talk a lot about this downstairs yeah already. we did but no, no one yeah. else heard it yeah so <laughs> lo- lo- um logistically it works in that you said it's like a, a yeah, how long yeah. is the program how does it yeah the structures we we want to keep it very um it's going to be it's very verbal and very interactive and very organic so what we're doing is we're doing a we're going to do uh symposiums so critique symposiums once a month in drawing and painting. So there's two different programs that we're running. And what it is is we're going to have maybe 50. It depends on how many people sign up. Mm-hmm. We have a limit on how many people. We don't want to go over 150 people. We want to do about 50 uh, portfolio cr- or painting critiques or drawing critiques every month. And we're going to go through everybody's work and verbally communicate with them so they can ask questions about what they need to work on. Mm-hmm. Career as well as what they're creating. So it's not just technical it's also going to be, uh, we're going to have gallery directors come in from my gallery in New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to Skype with people from L.A. that I work with a gallery out in L.A., Santa Fe, and, and New York. And I have very good relationships with them. We're going to bring in their directors and, and do online Q&As for the yeah. community. It's we just really want to, yeah, we want to really bring a community together of artists that kind of can help each other. Right. You right. know, so we built an online forum on the back end that has a, once you become a member, you, you're, you can go onto the forum. Mm-hmm. We're going to have resources on there, uh, drawing resources, painting resources, books, everything. And people are going to be able to share stuff that they find. Yeah. So I love this idea of having a hundred minds all with the same kind of direction Mm -hmm. that they're putting towards something rather than just one solo person going on the web trying to find information you have a hundred people doing that and that bring that to the community is that we all rise together so it's this idea of a rising tide lifts all boats right so it's uh that's we really want to build that constructive uh community about work so the um so the the cool thing about it is is when you're doing these individual critiques or critiquing a piece, everyone in the group has an opportunity to to be a part yeah. of that critique or not be a part, but to listen in on that critique. Can, exactly, that's that's also yeah. huge, and we're going to record them so that they they'll be on the website so that people can go back and use them as a resource later on. Right. So we're using uh, we're going to be looking into Adobe Connect, which I've is never a, used a that. I'll have to look into it. It's, so Shana, com- her experience of she actually does distance learning mm-hmm. through the Art Academy in San Francisco and getting her master's that way. She uses this program all the time. And so she's like an expert in it and, yeah. and how to interact online with people. So yeah. she brings that, that real uh, personal voice to, to what we're doing. Right. So it's going to be it, it's really amazing. You have like all the you almost like have to raise your hand online yeah. so right. you can talk. And then there's also a chat room as well as live video and paint overs. So I can bring someone's artwork in there and I can use uh, Photoshop work directly to work on it. top and say this edge should turn more, right. this color temperature should shift, or maybe let's get some color in your shadows. What type of paint are you using for this? Um, it's going to be really, really live and immersive. Yeah. It, and it's going to be very demo based on each individual's artwork. And over the year, what, what I'm really excited about is that it, it's going to grow and become organic and shift with what direction they want to move towards. So right. it's going to be individualized attention. And we're trying to keep the price as low as possible for an entire year, year subscription program. Yeah. yeah. What, um, one thing that I, that I find, why, the reason I brought that up uh, of being able to, l- to listen in on someone else's critique is you find that, that so many people are often making the same 
mistakes or this are making yes. the same choices yeah. that are causing the same results. And so, uh, so I, we were just talking downstairs about how how often you, you know you'll. I'll be in a workshop like yours and I'll hear you say something to someone three students down and I'll go, oh yeah, I just did that too. And I made this, I made the same mistake. Yeah. And so there's so, and a lot of times when, when you're under the gun, you know, if you have someone that, that walks over and is looking over your shoulder at your painting, it's not as easy to listen. Or, or maybe yeah. it's like you're, you kind of clam up a little bit or something like that, or you become defensive. But when you hear no, other people yes. being critiqued, you can recognize those mistakes a lot of times. No, that's a very good point. Actually, like, I'm, I'm always trying to diffuse that yeah. in any way. W when I actually do talk to people individually, mm -hmm. it's um, like when I was in school, I had a very nurturing teacher, but she was also very challenging. Mm -hmm. So that every, every – um, you have to understand critiques are crazy. So a constructive criticism comes from a place where – we just want you to get better. Right. There's no, there's no ulterior motives. There's nothing negative about it mm -hmm. at all. Like we're really, uh, dedic like we use a stupid tagline called dedicated to your personal excellence. Yeah. You know, so we, yeah. we are there to help you get better. And right. that's, um, but what you said is really interesting. When I remember when I used to have a, when, I <laughs> uh, cause I studied for a very long time at the art students league and painting from life and the teacher would come around and when she'd get to me, that's when I saw everything that was wrong in, right. in what I was painting. I couldn't see it when I was by myself. Right. But then when she's looking over my shoulder, it <laughs> it almost as soon as she arrived. Without I, saying I, a word, huh? No, you without saying say, like, I, it was like the, the idea of double scrutiny right. on what I was working on was, uh, it was in play. And I yeah. just remember being, like, being able to see clearer by having someone to point out uh, different directions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I found um, that super helpful. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I feel the same way. You feel like everything is going pretty well, and then, and it's almost like the the instructor is getting closer to you, and you and you make a bad mark, and you're like, oh, I need to correct that, and you make a worse mark, and you're like, oh, it wasn't that bad until you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there is no bad marks. There. I think about look, a painting is all, um, which is I think um, I, I, I relate this to tattooing because mm -hmm. it's funny. I I gave I've done two tattoos in my life. Uh, one where I, I got to noodle on it for like six, seven hours. Oh, wow. You know, uh, based on one of my paintings. <laughs> and another, I gave my, my fiance a tattoo on the back of her neck that was just, it was just two lines. It was a little heart. Uh -huh. So I had to go two different lines. And Which I is did one far line more difficult than the six hours. Way more thing. difficult <laughs> yeah. than something I could noodle. Right. And, and the noodling was very much like a painting for mm -hmm. me. Like, I almost love having those mistakes yeah. in my painting because it gives history right. to, to what I did. And, and there's a little bit of. Um, it's funny, now that I, I've been painting for a while, I used to want to make everything perfect, but now I actually leave things that only I would know is a mistake in mm -hmm. a painting so that I can see that 10 years from now and be like, and yeah. have a little inside joke with myself. Yeah. You know? So I leave stuff that's kind of like not quite there. Right. And I know it. You know? And yeah. I think ten, I haven't seen it 10 years yet, but like 10 years from now, I'll probably be like, I guess that wasn't as bad of a mistake as I left for myself. You right. know, I, I'm going to be easier on myself. Yeah. But the idea of, uh, of having that history of mistakes is really, it, it, it shows a human hand sure. in, in what you're doing. And I can see that in, like, the noodling tattoo. Right. There's a lot of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, because I was just learning. So. What did you, were you able to read the skin well enough in that long of a tattoo to be confident that you were making... More, or did you, you know, have you seen it, it like, healed? I guess is a better question. Have you seen that tattoo healed? You know, I worked with, uh, with Moran Billy about that in Monte Catini when uh -huh. I was in Italy two years ago. And, uh, the guy did send me a, a healed version of it, Yeah. you know, but Moran was kind of also really helping me. So he was like telling okay. me to go darker, yeah. you know, cause you don't want it to look like to eventually just fade away. Right. Cause you, you, like you were talking about earlier about this idea of getting ink into the skin mm -hmm. when you're very, when you start out, you're, you're hold that over and over again right you know you really want it to stick and right and make it permanent yeah you know yeah. and also so that your design stays where it is supposed to stay right you know and um i think it turned out okay but he went yeah. over it and probably fixed it since oh okay i he, think he yeah, did some work probably. on it afterwards yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting i'd love to i'd mine. love to see it i um <laughs> <laughs> I'm always curious about about accomplished artists that take on uh, tattooing, you know, just yeah. the, because it's such a yeah. different way. Because it's so it's such a deliberate way to make a mark. You have to yeah. really like will a line into skin. It yeah, doesn't yeah. just happen the way that paint falls off of a brush. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's always interesting to see that transition take place. The deliberate's a great word. I think of that mm -hmm. within painting. Every yeah. every uh, every painting, I guess every tattoo is a thought about exactly. You're, you're thinking about the subject that you're trying to capture in the skin. Yeah. And yeah. so that idea that every mark is important, every movement, every thought. Right. Is, uh, so then when you're doing a tattoo on someone that's like a personal tattoo for you to give to somebody, it's, um, 
you're putting like your thoughts on their skin, yeah. which is really kind of like a romantic y kind of weird way yeah. Yeah. kind of thing to think about it. And it's the skin is capturing all of your your knowledge about what you're creating. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I agree. I, I I remember Jeff Hine in his workshop saying, I forget what he called it, it was like the 3 three thirty rule or something like that, where he, he talked about each individual mark. Be, like if if it's not adding anything, don't make the mark. A lot of people are just laying paint down yeah, to lay it down. Yeah. And he said, you know, that, that a painting should be interesting from from three inches, three feet, and thirty feet. I so agree. like, I agree. Uh, yeah. uh, and I would, I never thought of it that way, but that that says a lot to the marks. You know, like yeah. that mark should serve a purpose. Well, that and also design to be right. able to see something from thirty feet away that interests you. Right. You know, it has a lot to do with the design. Yeah. And so that and, and as you get closer, you're uh, you get more information from what you're looking at. You yeah. Know? So I think that's that's. that's Great, a uh, great, great thing. Yeah, me too. And I, and I'd never had thought of it. Uh, I've tried to to apply that to tattooing since then because one thing that you notice in tattoos is you get a decent, you get across the room. If a tattoo can grab your attention from across the room, well, that was a really excellent design because it's it's hard to read tattoos from far away because once they're healed, you're kind of looking through this film at the image. So you can only push contrast so hard. You're looking through skin into yeah, yeah. an image, and so. Um, so for a tattoo to grab your attention from from far away and and make you want to get closer to it, um, it really takes some planning and some some uh, yeah. you know thought beforehand. And so when Jeff mentioned that, I was like, oh, that's a great. I should start to push that idea in tattooing yeah, yeah. Uh, and painting. Oh, yeah, that's it. a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how long we've gone now. We're probably twenty minutes. Okay. Twelve. Oh, that's on this new yeah. side. Okay. Um, it seemed like there was something else I was going to. Oh, where do people go as far as the new project? Oh, the uh, new project. It's uh, artcritacademy.com. Artcriticacademy? Yeah. Art, artcrit. Crit. Crit. Okay. Yeah. C-R-I-T. And it's going to start up when, do you we're think? We're starting in August. Right now we're taking enrollment right now. Okay. And uh, we're going we're gonna to start doing, we're going to do an orientation. We're also gonna, probably going to do some, we're going we're gonna to be testing out the software on the community that's already signed up. Yeah. Probably in June and July. Because I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm moving to Albuquerque for the summer. That's what else I was going to talk to you studio, about. Our studio there, we're going to be doing Ala Prima, because I want to get better at Ala Prima. Yeah. Always trying to push. I'm always trying to make my weaknesses into strengths. Mm -hmm. So Ala Prima is a weakness of mine right now. Just right. like um, like three or four years ago, hands painting hands were a really big weakness yeah. of mine. So I delved into painting hands. Yeah. Now I feel like that's a strength, and now I feel like. All the prima is something I want to bring up to that level. Right. So this idea is that we're going to be painting three, four times like a week in the in the studio, three, four hour paintings. Huh. We're going to have every one of our friends come out to visit us in Albuquerque. Like if anyone yeah. out there wants to come get her portrait painted in Albuquerque and wants to be a free model, yeah. uh, come on down <laughs> for like three hours. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's going to be Shane and I are going to be like really intense in the studio. And uh, we're going to be broadcasting a lot of that through our oh. community for fun, you know, yeah, and yeah. just as testing the market of the, uh, of the software that we're using or whatever, as well as, uh, trying to provide content for people that sign up early. Yeah. yeah. Well, that move to Albuquerque, um, you're, I mean, it's, it's kind of a bold move because you're a professional painter living in Brooklyn, yeah. which seems like a place a professional painter needs to live yeah. <laughs> if you want to be part I of a, a scene. I it, think you do in the beginning, but you don't really But you don't once you have representation. I have this, so. Well, no, I have this theory. I mean, I, it's probably the same with tattooing. Mm -hmm. If you do a really amazing tattoo and you're on top of your game and everyone's going to notice it right away, mm -hmm. um, galleries will notice it. They'll come find you. Yeah. You don't have to be in new york or whatever like i moved to new york 17 years ago in brooklyn you yeah. know i could have probably moved out a long time ago yeah you know i have my structure there i don't need to be at openings or or mm. schmoozing i need to be in the studio making really impactful strong important paintings right you know that's i mean if there's any faith in if i have any faith in humanity at all <laughs> right. i mean that's yeah. what i want to uh, that's what i want to create and that's what i want to have notice and be respected for right you know what's well, like I don't want to be respected to get into a gallery because I schmoozed somebody. Sure. You know what I mean? Or I bought this guy a beer or whatever. Right. You know, I want to be there because of the art is solid. Yeah. You know, and I think that's yeah. the case for everybody. Yeah. No, that, 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 that makes sense. I, um, it just, it, it seems like if you've kind of come up in that and, and, and Brooklyn's been a big, probably a big part yeah. of what has gotten you to where you are is being in the area, just resources. stepping away from yeah, the resources. Resources there are amazing. Yeah. I mean, like to go to the Met and see paintings in New York and, and to be able to study at the Art Students League, like painting from life for eight hours a day for five years, like that resource is amazing. But there's no reason why we can't create that somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, see that. Uh, I remember uh, talking uh, once to um, 
uh, to Casey Ball about he had just moved to a, a bigger studio in New York and was talking about I don't know we got into uh, to real estate and pricing and rents and all that and I was like God that's ridiculous why do you I mean is there not some place cheaper than that and he really felt like he was like I need to be there I, I need to be part of that I just need to be in the but, you know, at I, I totally disagree. Yeah. But, I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Teach their own, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, David Casson.com, I'm guessing is where everyone finds yeah, your yeah, work. Yeah, Instagram the is the same thing at David Casson. I'm sure yeah. most people watching the show probably already follow you on there. Uh, and then on your website is, uh, there'll probably be links to this. There's a link new. in my instruction section. It has all my workshops that I teach. And I also put a link to the, the academy that okay. we're starting. Awesome. Any, hey, any workshops coming up soon? I'm teaching in Akron uh, in like a couple weeks. Okay. Akron. This may not yeah. be out in it's that time. Anything yeah, no. in the summer? Summertime. I'm teaching in Albuquerque. We've, we've, we're, I'm starting to – our studio that we're doing is uh, no more than 10 students. Okay. And so we're keeping it like really small to the studio space there. So it's more individualized. Yeah. And uh, we're probably going to do – we sold out our, our workshops we're doing this summer. Um, I'm going to be teaching probably in December in Albuquerque again. Okay. And then um, I'm trying to think if anything's even open – are there a the lot of workshops sell out pretty fast? Yeah, you know, because yeah. I only teach five or six a year. Yeah. So oh, he has one in Memphis next May from yeah, Memphis we're gonna do one in twenty seventeen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Barbecue and painting. It's gonna and music fest. Can and we, music can fest. We bracket between <laughs> we can the do two. It. Yeah, we we'll do I'll it right be between there for the like two. Three weeks. Right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> three weeks. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be <laughs> the the, uh, uh, the 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 workshop's gonna be kind of expensive because it is a three week workshop, but it'll be fine. You'll get a lot out of it. There'll be a lot of barbecue. A lot of barbecue. So stoked. Yep. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming well, out dude, and doing thank it. Thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't bought a parallel palette, buy one. They're awesome. I mean, if you know, unless you don't paint, and then don't buy it. No, you should definitely buy it. It slices it, tomatoes <laughs> oh, it does really it well. Good. Yeah, it, it julienne your carrots. <laughs> I don't even know what that even means. Well, then get one. Yeah. Get one for that, too. Tattooimprovement.com. Sign up for our newsletter. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks.